And it's my pleasure to invite our uh, next speaker up, uh, Steve Scott. Been working actually a few years to get Steve here, so finally I succeeded. Uh, it's been uh, one of my goals to make happen. And uh, uh, you know, back then he was with a different company. <laughs> So senior, Steve is a senior vice president and a senior fellow and chief technology officer uh, of HPC and AI at Julie Packet uh, Enterprises. Uh, he has uh, hold 42 US patents, uh, chief architect of several supercomputing systems. Most of you know him. Uh, he received the 2005 ACM uh, Murray Wilkins Award and the 2005 IEEE Seymour Cray Award. Um, and he has all his degree pedigree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So Steve? All yours. All right. Thank you very much. This is what happens when you mic yourself. Just don't turn it on. Um, so yeah, it's been a long time. But uh, we finally have three worldwide announced exascale systems. And I'm pleased as punch that they're all, they're all Cray Shasta systems. Um, but exaflop is you know, just another uh, milestone, right? We've had our megaflop, teraflop, petaflop, exaflop. We'll have zetaflop eventually. Um, there's nothing magical about the number. It's just kind of a nice round number to talk about. Um, but, but this one has been A, harder because of some technology issues. But B, it's really corresponding with some pretty fundamental shifts that are happening in the, in the industry at large. We are moving to a much more data-centric form of computing. We're all, we're all drowning in data, and everything is becoming much more about processing data. Uh, and people are interested increasingly at taking analytics and AI and folding it into their simulations. So it's really a, a, a transformation going on right now. And we've been thinking about a lot of these trends as we design Shasta, so to try to motivate the, the architecture for Shasta. And I'll just walk through some of those. So we've all heard about the Cambrian explosion that's going on right now. Um, we've got uh, CMOS processors are, are nearing the end of their lifetime. We've got a few more generations of Moore's Law left, but Denard scaling ended quite a while ago. And I'm not getting, my advancing is not advancing. I'll stand over here. Keep up. Hmm. There we go. Uh, Denard scaling uh, ended. It's getting harder and harder to, to get more processing uh, performance out of the underlying CMOS. And so what's happening is people are turning to architectural specialization whether it's CPU computing or FPGA computing or any one of dozens of different AI startups, et cetera, processors are getting hotter and they're getting more heterogeneous. Um, we are also facing this, this uh, change in, boy, very interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll have to literally press that little button. We're also uh, facing a change in the way people are using processors or systems, as I talked about before. We've, we've seen the convergence of analytics and artificial intelligence and simulation and modeling. And this is what we think of as sort of data center computing. More and more um, uh, processing of data puts tremendous amount of stress on the interconnect, puts a tremendous amount of stress on the, uh, on the I.O. subsystem. Cloud computing is becoming ubiquitous. Every organization is moving at least some of their workloads to the cloud. More important than where, you know, how, how the processing is delivered, though, is just the software environment that people are getting used to. Uh, they're getting used to self-provisioning. They're getting used to having you know, container orchestration with dynamic environments that they can spin up different environments to run any kind of software that they want. Right? You, you, can, if you, if you, you can sort of take your environment with you. Uh, people want to be able to develop anywhere, run anywhere, uh, and, and take advantage of lots of software services that are available. And then uh, we're also seeing some pretty fundamental changes in uh, memory and storage technology with, uh, with flash coming, becoming the new scratch file, uh, the, the new scratch storage media um, tape uh, kind of giving way to disk as the new archive media. And then uh, the memory system being sucked onto the processor with, with high bandwidth memory. So we thought about all these uh, in the design of Shasta. And Shasta is really a ground up rethinking of how we build hardware and how we build software. Uh, we're trying to, from a hardware perspective, to have a much more flexible infrastructure um, and also a much more extensible infrastructure. You know, the first thing you think about for green computing is you don't want to throw away your computer every three years when you upgrade it. So the ability to upgrade for over a decade is, is, is top of mind. Um, the XC system that we've been shipping for a number of years is, uh, is great in lots of ways, but it's not flexible. 
right? You can have any number of nodes you want per blade as long as it's four, and you can have any amount of network bandwidth per node as long as it's one PCIe Gen 3 by 16, and the node can be any size you want as long as it's that, right? It's a very in, inflexible design, and we, we hit limits there in terms of, uh, especially as we started looking at hotter and hotter processors that we just couldn't accommodate in that system design. So Shasta is designed to have a wide diversity of processors of all shapes and sizes, and particularly um, of, of increasingly higher and higher wattages. We also developed a new interconnect called Slingshot, which I'll talk a fair amount about, uh, and a whole new software stack, which, I, which I'll also say a little bit more about later, that's a much more dynamic cloud-like um, software environment. Um, so, you might have noticed, by the way, that uh, you know, Cray's been acquired by HPE. I thought I'd say a few words about that. Uh, the, the transaction closed in September of uh, 2019, and it literally took one month for our organizations to be fully combined. We're not running as kind of a little subsidiary off to the side, so Pete Ungaro, who used to be the CEO of uh, Cray, is now running the combined HPC and AI organization inside HPE. Actually, more recently, we pulled in a couple of additional HPE units, their mission critical, their edge line, their moonshot division are now pulled in underneath Pete. Um, and within one month, we had a combined blended leadership team. Um, I still report to Pete, but and several other of his reports from Cray do, but several of the HPC uh, team from HPE and now a few others from HPE also report into him. Uh, and we had one organization working as one team. We also, within the first month, month and a half, had pretty much fully blended our storage, our storage and compute roadmaps. Relatively easy to do because they were somewhat complementary. There were some things that we were doing um, in both companies, and we chose one. Um, the, uh, the liquid cooled infrastructure is kind of following forward from the, from the uh, infrastructure that Cray was designing, although there was some very similar work going on at HPE. Cray was doing a bunch of air cooled kind of commodity cabinets to complement that. Those go away and they get replaced by the HPE Apollo. Our storage roadmaps get merged together under cluster store. So we had pretty much blended together as a single company uh, within, a first, uh, with, within the first month. And at the beginning of this year, Cray went away as an entity. We're now just fully part of HPE. But the Cray systems and the Cray brands will, will definitely persist. This just gives you a little bit of perspective of what HPE was thinking about when they acquired Cray. This was from an interview that Antonio Neri gave just a, a couple weeks after the Cray acquisition. We basically highlighted a couple of key technologies, the interconnect and, and the software stack, and said, you know, this is why we acquired Cray, and we have plans to take this more, much more broadly throughout HPE. So I can tell you I've been having a lot of fun walking around inside HPE and talking to all sorts of different groups about Slingshot in particular, uh, but there's some interesting things going on on the software side as well. So uh, back, to, back to Shasta and the flexibility. From a hardware perspective, on the XC systems, you had one uh, liquid-cooled cabinet, and then if you wanted to have I/O uh, nodes, you had to kind of design them into this customized cabinet. And if you wanted other stuff that didn't fit in the customized cabinet, you basically had to buy a separate system and hook it up to the side through the I/O subsystem and share it. That all goes away with Shasta. There's two in physical infrastructures: the Apollo infrastructure uh, coming from HPE, the Olympus infrastructure, which is the dense liquid-cooled infrastructure, uh, and you can kind of get anything under the sun to put into the Apollo infrastructure. Uh, but then we do a, a smaller number of custom blades, high performance blades that are really intended to optimize for the, the key computational uh, technologies that go into the, <coughs> into the Shasta, I'm um, sorry, the Olympus infrastructure. And that has uh, very high density and, and uh, direct warm water cooling. But it's the same interconnect that spans them and it's the same software environment. So it's literally just a physical infrastructure choice. It makes no difference in terms of the look and feel of the system, in terms of the performance of the software and the, and the user experience. It's literally just uh, a packaging choice. This is, gives you a little bit more uh, insight into the Olympus infrastructure. Um, it's, it's pretty. Uh, you can see that uh, you've got direct liquid cooling to all the components. Every cabinet has four, a stack of four chassis on the left and other four chassis on the right. Each chassis has eight compute blades that plug into it. So you've got 64 compute blades. Into a, uh, into a single cabinet. They plug in from the front, and then from the back, you have these network cards that plug in orthogonally, and you can plug in anywhere from one to eight network cards per chassis. So you have quite a bit of, of uh, configurability in terms of how much network bandwidth you have. And then for every three or four um, uh, uh, cabinets, you've got a, a separate control uh, 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 cooling distribution unit for, uh, for cooling. 
And so this is, everything is, is uh, liquid cooled, even the optical transceivers for the active optical cables, the memories, the, the, the processors, et cetera. And we can pack a lot into this. We can put 512 GPUs, high wattage GPUs, plus 128 CPUs, plus up to 64 network switches into a single cabinet. Um, right now, they'll, they'll start shipping at about 250 kilowatts, going up to 300 kilowatts, and by the time we need it, up to 400 kilowatts in a, in a single cabinet. And you kind of compare that as to what you can put in an air-cooled cabinet with cracks and stuff. It's, you know, 35 kilowatts or something like that. Um, and these processors aren't getting any colder. Uh, we, are, we have already seen processor roadmaps with processors above a kilowatt, right? And so once we're, out of, once we're done with, with traditional Moore's Law scaling, by the way, we're going to keep trying to exponentially cram more stuff onto the processors. But what we're going to do is we're going to do chip stacking, 3D chip stacking. Right? And so there, you're not getting any process improvement at all. So it's going to be even worse in the end of Denard scaling. It's going to drive uh, power up even more. So having that power and cooling headroom is, is important. The way that the network blades and the compute blades are, are put in the system also gives you the flexibility to put a second generation network, a third generation network. We will absolutely be going to optics everywhere within a couple of generations um, without having to worry about redesigning the electrical backplane or, that sort of thing. So it gives us a lot of flexibility on the interconnect side as well. When I think about, when, you know, I, I, I assert that we need to have multiple different compute technologies because the world is using specialization. I don't think there's any better example of that than if you just look at the first three systems that were announced. They had four different compute blades in them. Um, we have the AMD Rome based uh, compute blade, which just has four dual socket AMD ROMs for your, for your standard CPU computing. We've got uh, a, des a design uh, that's going into the uh, NERSC system with AMD EPIC CPUs and four uh, NVIDIA Volta Nex GPUs. We've got a similar design, which was uh, announced that it's going into the uh, Oak Ridge Frontier system, which is also a one to four ratio of CPU and GPU, also using the AMD EPIC CPU. This one is a, is a custom CPU that they're doing after Milan. Uh, but, this, but, but now, you, instead of having PCIe, you've got a, their AMD Infinity Fabric, which is their coherent NVLink-like fabric connecting up the nodes. You'll also see that because they've got more PCIe links on, the, on their, on their uh, GPUs, that we now have the, uh, we have the interconnect, four interconnect uh, uh, ports going directly to the GPUs rather than feeding through the CPU. So a little bit different, uh, but at a high level, if you squint, very similar node architectures. And then there's the Intel, <laughs> all the cameras come out, the Intel uh, uh, blade that's going into uh, the Argon machine. It's kind of funny. I, the, the last time I gave this talk, maybe the time before, there was just a big blob that had a few names inside because Intel wouldn't let us say anything. Um, now I can show the picture that they showed publicly. Uh, but they're not saying a whole lot about this compute blade. Uh, but you, know, you can see that it's got a couple of Xeons in it and six of their, of their XE uh, GPUs. So, very similar, you'll, you'll note that everyone that's going for big flops is, is going GPU. I don't see that going away, uh, but there are, there are different reasons to pick these uh, different variants, and you know, straight CPU systems are not going to be going away. So let me say a little bit about Slingshot, which is one of my favorite topics. I, we, we've done, at Cray, eight generations now of scalable, massively parallel interconnects. I personally worked on all eight of them. And I can tell you that I am more excited about Slingshot than I am about any of the, the, the previous seven versions. Um, we've, we've done a lot of pioneering in the past with adaptive routing, and we, you know, we did the first high reddick switch design, a 64 switch back in 2006, about a decade before anyone else uh, got to that point. I invented this thing called the Dragonfly based on a, a high reddick uh, switch. Uh, but, but Slingshot d does, uh, takes this a step further. The first thing to note is that we have decided to stop building proprietary networks and instead adopt Ethernet. So for years, you could either get the commodity, interoperable, you know, Ethernet network, or you could get a high-performance network. And they were very different things. Uh, you know, and, and we just kept building proprietary networks because you could get a lot better performance than you could with, with Ethernet. And then we finally realized that in this sort of new data-centric world where everyone's exchanging data and, and, and looking at the hyperscalers and what they're doing, the world is going to Ethernet. So we decided to stop fighting them and instead join them but instead of just using a commodity Ethernet, we're going to redesign Ethernet and bring HPC to Ethernet. So we have standard Ethernet connectivity at the edges. You can talk to standard NICs. You can talk to other data center switches, et cetera. But inside, it's like a state-of-the-art HPC fabric. 
Um, it's, a state, it's also kind of state of the art, not distinguished over what you can get uh, uh, elsewhere if you look at the high end Ethernet switches, but in terms of the speeds and feeds. So uh, we, our Rosetta switch is 64 ports times 200 gigabits per second. Um, this allows you to build really big systems like those exascale systems with a network diameter of just three switch to switch hops. Uh, and it, you know, it's the, di the diameter is three, whether it's two cabinets or 20 cabinets or 200 cabinets, uh, which is a neat thing about this Dragonfly topology and, and having high reddick switches. We, one of the areas where we were behind in the past was in quality of service. We actually haven't had it before. And um, people have tended to love our networks over time, but the one Achilles heel is um, interference between different jobs. You know, I run my job on Monday, then I run it on Tuesday, I get different results because somebody else is doing something on the machine, which is causing interference. And uh, this can be a, a, a real issue. So we have uh, implemented uh, uh, QoS, uh, and it's very flexible. I won't get into all the details here, but it's got lots of interesting things you could do to, to overlay multiple virtual networks on top of the physical network, and very good adaptive routing. We've been doing adaptive routing for a long time. But that only helps you, QoS only helps you if you can put two different jobs on different traffic classes. And most of your jobs are all going to be running on the same traffic class. So the really interesting thing about SyncSod is this congestion control. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. But we have reinvented how congestion control is done. I'm super excited about it. It's working really, really well. And what it does is it provides you very strong performance isolation between workloads. So you can run your job to Tuesday and run it again on Wednesday, and someone else can be do something horrible on the network, and um, you, can, you can isolate the, the job you care about from the, from the person that's doing something horrible. And what that gives you at the end is not only lower average latency, but much more uniform latency. Um, so we've, we've done tests with, with and without congestion control where you see latency kind of going all over the place without congestion control, and you turn on the congestion control and you just get very uniform latency. And that tail latency matters any time in the HPC world you do synchronization, and it matters in the, in the, uh, you know, the hyperscale data center world any time you've got a service level agreement that involves you know, hundreds or thousands of different remote procedure calls in a distributed um, software architecture. So um, tail latency is something that, that we focus on a lot. From a packaging perspective, we've, we've got uh, the, the standard top rack switch and the standard you know, half height, half length PCIe card um, that, that Slingshot uses. But then we've also got different forms of packaging that go into this very dense, liquid, cooled infrastructure. And then we use the same cabling in both of these scenarios. It's a combination of active optical cables for everything that goes farther than about three meters and uh, short copper cables. It turns out that we can build a system the size of Frontier, you know, an exa, multi-exaflop system, um, where 90% of the cables in the system are short, cheap, reliable electrical copper cables. And only 10% of them have to be optics. That's part of the beauty of having the, the Dragonfly topology and, and the, um, the high reddick switches. Uh, but so for the, those long cables, we use active optical cables, and then we have a short little uh, Y cables that connect down to processors and QSFP-based uh, cables for intra-cabinet communication. So we've got Slingshot in the, in the field now, but we've had it in-house for a while now. We've, we've been running some uh, large systems. The biggest system we put together is 1,000 nodes with a dual injection point per node, so it's 2,000 endpoints. And this is just a chart looking at uh, MPI communication, all-to-all -all communication uh, on, on, on that system. And what you're seeing is the actual um, realized sustained bandwidth across all of the global links. And you can see that it's darn close to, to 100%. 25 uh, uh, gigabytes per second is, is 100%. So <clears throat> we're getting very, very high sustained throughput, which, which is great. Uh, but, but the more exciting thing is the congestion control. So a chip, typical congestion control like ECN, what it does is, is as packets go through the network, if they encounter congestion, oh, I've hit a long queue. I'm being stuck here for a while before I can go across this link. They flip a bit. They set a bit um, to say this packet went through somewhere congestion. And then it finally gets to its destination, and you get a response back, and the source, the response has that bit echoed in it, and the, the sender says, oh, I just got a congestion bit. And then it kind of counts how many congestion bits it's getting, and after a while it's going, look, I've got, I'm sending too much, I'm gonna slow down the rate at which I'm sending stuff. And eventually, if you've got long, stable flows, you will converge to a rate where you're injecting just the right amount of bandwidth. And the whole time you're doing this, you're still blocking traffic in the network. You have this head of line blocking trap problem where, where you know, uh, Charlie over there is causing congestion, and I'm stuck behind his traffic. I'm going somewhere else, but I'm stuck behind Charlie's traffic. That's not a good thing, 
right? And so you've got that interference even while you're trying to converge. And then if you run a dynamic HPC style workload where the traffic patterns are changing frequently, you're kind of not going to converge. Or maybe you'll converge for this workload, but then you change the system size or run a different workload and it doesn't converge. It tends to be very fragile. What Slingshot does instead is that it has hardware that literally tracks every packet between every pair of virtual endpoints in the system. So it knows what's, it, it categorizes them into flows. It knows what is out there. Um, and when you start getting congestion, it pushes back very, very quickly to try to prevent congestors from queuing up traffic that just sits there in the network, queuing up, uh, taking up buffer space and getting in the way. But it does it in a way that only impacts that particular virtual end-to-end -end flow. And all the rest of the traffic can go unimpeded. And so what you get is you get freedom of head-of-line blocking across the entire fabric, not just on a single chip, but across the entire fabric. And it converges very quickly. It's very stable across lots and lots of different uh, uh, traffic patterns. And uh, you, you don't get the interference even while it's trying to converge. And so you end up getting this very, very strong performance isolation. So some of you who've heard me talk about this may have seen this chart before. This is actually a simulation of several thousand nodes. Uh, we've done very similar things uh, on, on, on real systems now. But what you're seeing here is actually a slingshot network, but with the congestion control turned off. And you'd see something very similar on an earlier Cray Aries network or an InfiniBand network. Uh, and what this is is horrible interference between jobs. There are three different jobs here that are randomly distributed across the machine. The blue job is a well-behaved all-to-all communication. The red job is well-behaved job that's doing halo exchanges with your virtual neighbors and then a synchronization, then another halo exchange, and then another synchronization. So the red job is latency sensitive, can't go on to the next epoch until you've finished the last. And then the green job is causing random congestion throughout the network. It's the bad guy. And what happens, what we're showing here is the um, uh, Average egress bandwidth per endpoint, so 200 gigabits per second is 100% of peak. And initially, the blue and the red jobs get very close to peak. Uh, but then the, the congestion starts occurring, the green job ramps up, and the blue job gets terrible interference, much lower uh, throughput. And then eventually, when the green job goes away, you can see the blue job is getting almost 100% of peak. But what's really bad is the red job that's latency sensitive. You do your first halo exchange, and then a few packets, stragglers, get stuck in traffic. Eventually, your synchronization completes. Now you go on to the second halo exchange, and it's awful, right? You've got some packets that are um, stuck in traffic for over a millisecond uh, before, before they complete. And then, again, you kind of see what, what it should look like once the, once the congestion gets out of the way. Same exact network, turn on the congestion control, and you get this picture. You basically just get this beautiful performance isolation. The green job gets flow controlled, but it's limited by egress bandwidth anyway. And the red and the blue jobs continue with very little interference. So we're super excited about that. Uh, we've got a bunch of actual applications now we've run, and we can show that like on our XC systems, you can really interfere with these applications, and their performance varies quite a bit, run to run, when you're doing other stuff. And then on the, on the uh, Shasta uh, slingshot-based system, that just doesn't happen. Uh, we worked with a couple of the DOE labs to create a new network benchmark, because we were tired of seeing benchmarks like ping pong latency, which tells you very little. It tells you, you know, I always say ping pong latency is like trying to figure out your commute into New York City in the morning to go to work. But going and driving the route alone at 4 o'clock in the morning and determining it's great. Right? Your actual congestion, your actual latency through a real network under load has very little to do with your, with your unloaded fall through latency and everything to do with your queuing latency that, that you, that you uh, achieve. And so what GPC Net tries to do is, is mimic real world traffic patterns and run the system at load and measure um, not only your average latency, but your, your mean latency, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> your, your tail latency, uh, as well as throughput. And then it also throws congestion onto the network and then sees what happens to the, to the program under test. And we see some pretty interesting results. Um, here's the GP set random ring congestion test. And what we're showing here is average unloaded latency. This is akin to MPI ping pong. Um, and uh, what we have here is we're looking at um, what a uh, slingshot network versus uh, uh, an EDR InfiniBand network, and, and we're worse than InfiniBand um, in terms of unloaded latency, not what we optimize for. Now, when we throw the congestors on, we look at the average latency, and we see a very different picture. Um, and I'm not picking on InfiniBand because the same thing would happen on the, the Aries-based Cray network uh, before slingshot. And then if we look at the tail latency, we kind of see this picture. Um, regular networks have this tremendous uh, vulnerability to, to congestion, which can really play havoc on, on tail latency, and that kind of goes away 
with, uh, with slingshot. So here is uh, something called the congestion impact. This is another thing that the benchmark spits out. This is looking at real systems. Um, the first three systems are uh, Aries-based systems. The next uh, two are InfiniBand, or next three are InfiniBand, and the last one is a slingshot system. And what we're seeing is the congestion impact. This is the relative performance, um, uh, how much worse things get, if you will, when you throw on the congester. And it's a log base 10 graph, so these numbers are really quite large. Uh, the, the, the light blue bar, or the light green bar, is showing average, and the, and the dark green is showing the 99% tail. And there are a few things we can see. First of all is the impact from congestion gets worse with scale and taper. Uh, if you look at uh, you know, going from Theta to Edison, uh, they're both the same network taper, uh, but Edison is larger and the congestion impact gets worse. If you look at Summit and Sierra, these are the world's two largest supercomputers today. They're at uh, Oak Ridge and, and Livermore. Um, similar scale, but uh, Summit is 100% taper and, 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 and Sierra is a 50% taper. That means the global bandwidth is half of the injection bandwidth. And you can see that that makes it, makes it worse. Um, the next takeaway is that InfiniBand actually does a little bit better than Ares. Um, you know, if you look at these two systems, they're kind of similar scale and both 50% taper. And you can see that Theta, the Ares-based system, is worse than, than Sierra. But, but the take-home message here is that Malbec is just like ridiculously good. Um, so I, again, I could not be more pleased by, by these sorts of results. OK, so that's it on, on uh, Slingshot. Let me turn my attention a little bit to uh, storage. The traditional model of storage, which we have been using for multiple generations of uh, machines at, at Cray, has a, a, a compute network with a, a high-speed network tying all the nodes together. And then you've got your LNet router nodes, and then you've got an external storage network. So you've got some high-speed network, LNet router nodes, and, and then maybe an Ethernet or more likely an InfiniBand storage area network. What we've done with Shasta is just pull the storage directly onto the high-speed network. You can still do a standalone storage network if, if you so choose. If you don't happen to have a, a Shasta, you'd probably go get a Shasta. But if you don't, you can still do that. But with a, there's a better together story here where instead of having these things attached to an external network, we have flash nodes and hard drive-based nodes, and they attach directly onto the Slingshot interconnect. And what that gives you then is the ability to do two things. One, you can, um, you can well, it, it basically gives you the ability to optimize your system separately for IOPS and, and throughput and for capacity. So you, you uh, instantiate enough flash to give yourself the performance that you need, and then you put the rest of it in hard drive to give you the capacity that you need. And the fact that it is pulled onto the network means, especially when you're doing small IOPS type operations, your throughput goes up pretty substantially. Um, it takes out cost, it takes out complexity, uh, and, and, and your performance is just generally better. So here is just a, a high level overview of the E1000, which is the, the, the brand name of the, of the next generation cluster store uh, architecture. Uh, and what we're seeing here is a, a lot of flexibility to tailor your system. So you've got, you've got uh, a, a scalable storage unit based on flash, which gives you 60 or 80 gigabytes per second uh, for, for writes and reads, respectively, to, for a single storage unit. And it can give you uh, up to 55 terabytes of, of capacity. Uh, then you can have a, a, uh, a hybrid flash uh, disk storage unit that gives you that same bandwidth uh, from, from the flash, but then also layers in some, some hard drive for extra capacity, about 15 gigabytes per second, up to about a petabyte. And then you can have an all uh, hard drive-based uh, scalable storage unit where you're getting about 30 gigabytes per second of performance and up to two petabytes. And then if you want kind of larger, you know, more, more storage uh, capacity oriented uh, storage, there's another offering that basically has the same number of head nodes, but, but more storage units. And now you're, you're still at the 30 gigabytes per second, uh, but you're up to backing that up with four petabytes worth of storage. So you can basically mix and match these. And we're seeing most of our customers do this. There are some that have just said, look, we're close enough to the tipping point that we are going to go all flash. So the big uh, next generation system that's going into NERSC, Perlmutter, has its entire scratch file system built out of flash. Most people are going with, it, with a tiered system. And then there's the, uh, there'll be increasing uh, sophistication in terms of managing the data across those tiers. 
You can start off with user directives. A little bit later this year, uh, there'll be support in workload managers to automatically stage data for your jobs. And then uh, a little bit further down the road, we'll have the ability to sort of automatically migrate data so you can just take a hands-off approach if you want uh, with lots of opportunities to put artificial intelligence in the loop to sort of optimize uh, your, your data placement. So if you think about this at a, at a per rack basis now, um, you can get up to 1.6 terabytes per second of bandwidth in a single rack with a, with a few petabytes of capacity if you're all flash, and you can get up to 120 gigabytes per second of bandwidth uh, to uh, up to 10 petabytes, a little bit more than 10 petabytes of usable capacity with, with, uh, with hard drives. Um, this, is, this is quite a bit higher than um, anything else available right now, in part because this is the first PCI Gen 4 based storage controller. Um, it's very kind of turnkey and, and you're able to scale up systems uh, almost linearly depending upon uh, how, how much you have to fold in metadata performance uh, as you scale the capacity. So uh, lastly, let me talk a little bit about what we're doing with, with software. Um, the XC system, kind of the same way the, the hardware was, where I talked about, you know, it's high performance, it's well optimized, but it's not very flexible. The XC software stack is kind of like this monolith. It's sleek and it's scalable and pretty. Well, maybe not so pretty, but uh, um, not at all flexible. If you want to get buildable source, if you want to swap in one co component for some other component, uh, sorry. Uh, the XC uh, the system was, was that. The, the Shasta system has really been designed to be much more flexible and extensible. Uh, all of the different software components have published open RESTful API.